When we talk about consensus mechanisms, then we essentially talk about situations where everything works out just fine. We try to find a solution for everyone to agree on a common understanding of the current state of the ledger. But in some cases, things may go wrong. In some cases, this may not work out. And in some cases, everyone may have a different understanding. And these situations are usually referred to as forks. All right, let's get started. Now, we talked about consensus a lot last time. Uh, we talked about the proof of work consensus mechanism. Uh, now it's time to actually find out how you can identify the most recent state of the lecture. And it turns out there is one simple rule, as you might have heard several times already. I also briefly mentioned it in some of the past classes and some of the past videos. And the simple rule is that you actually count the blocks. So on an intuitive level, what you're doing is you take the entire sequence, you take the block sequence, you look at how many blocks are part of the sequence, and then you're saying the longest version, so the blockchain version with the most valid blocks uh, as part of it, is actually the current status quo. Now, as you can see right here, and as I've mentioned, this is just the intuition, this is just the intuitive version, it's not the actual rule. Um, it's powerful because in many cases, in most cases actually, it will yield with the same results and it's just much easier to understand, but you have to be aware that the actual rule as it's implemented is somewhat different. And this goes back to what you can see here in the title, the greatest accumulated difficulty. Now the actual rule, what are you doing is, you're taking the block sequence and then you're counting these difficulty values, you're, you're aggregating these difficulty values we have looked at last time. So remember the inverse of the threshold value as a proxy for the work that has been spent to create these blocks, as an average proxy, of course, uh, since it's a probabilistic process. And what you're doing is you're taking the difficulty value from all of these blocks, and then you're saying the one version of the blockchain that has the highest ac accumulated difficulty, so aggregated number of these difficulty values, is regarded as the most recent version of the blockchain. Now, in most cases, it doesn't really matter which one of these two you pick. Or you can go with the intuitive version. Um, usually, when you have more blocks, then you also have a higher accumulated difficulty because these difficulty values, as you know, are only adjusted uh, every 2016 blocks. Um, so in many cases, will be exactly the same result. But there are some exceptions, there are some um, border cases, some edge cases, um, when it actually matters. And it's really important that this is the actual rule right here, so the greatest accumulated difficulty and not the longest chain. Let me give you an example. Um, when I, let's assume I started my own version of the Bitcoin blockchain right at the beginning. Uh, so when the first block, when the Genesis block uh, has been created, let's say, uh, I immediately um, created my own competing version, building on that Genesis block as a foundation, uh, right when the second block also for the actual Bitcoin blockchain has been created. Now, when you think about it, no matter how much or rather how little resources, computational resources I spend, I spend on my personal version, um, because of this 10 minute average, I could still just have created my own blockchain and would be at approximately the same uh, block count these days, even though there's significantly less uh, computational resources spent uh, on this blockchain. Uh, even worse, if it's just me, then I, I could have forged the timestamps. Uh, and I um, would actually, even if I didn't start at the beginning, I could have just recreated this entire block sequence with relatively little um, of relatively little computational resources. So obviously it's not a good idea to just rely on these block counts. It's much more secure when you define a specific threshold value, or in this case difficulty, uh, and in advance, and then you have to hash, you have to try and error until you end up with a valid hash value, and that way you can prove that a certain amount of work has been spent to create that version of the blockchain. And what we're doing by saying the one with the greatest accumulated difficulty is actually the most recent version, as we're saying that we believe in the version where the most work on average has been spent on. Of course, everything else has to be valid, so you're not accepting any transactions that don't have any cryptographic proof in there, so everything must be okay, and you can still verify that. But when there are two versions, let's say competing ones, um, and they're both valid, then you will always go with the one where on average, the highest amount of work has been spent on, as represented by the greatest accumulated difficulty. 
And what is great about this rule is that under normal circumstances, it leads back to a clear status quo. It, it always, as you will see, there might be some, maybe some disagreement for a short amount of time, but it always leads back uh, to uh, a clear status quo, except for some forks. We will look into forks right now. Um, most of them are just for a certain amount of time and they will get resolved exactly because of these rules right here. But there are some cases when forks can be persistent and it's, it's really interesting, first of all, and really important to understand that there are different types of forks and also to understand their consequences. Now, First, let's go with a quick definition. What is actually a fork? And a fork simply is a disagreement on the current state of the ledger that leads to two or more competing versions of the blockchain. As I said, this may be just for a short amount of time and then it gets resolved, but it can also be persistent. So it's for some case, for some cases, for some fork types, uh, this may actually lead to two competing blockchains uh, that coexist um, um, that create new uh, crypto assets, for example. So two versions of, of, of Bitcoin, if you, if you want to go with that example, um, that are competing. And how you can think of it in terms of the blockchain is you have this one block sequence right here. So you have block zero, block one, block two, and then at block two, you have this disagreement. So there are two uh, successors created for block two. We have block three right here, but we also have block three alternatives, B3A right here. Uh, so you have one blockchain version, this one right here, and then you have a second one, which would be this one right here. And of course this could go on, especially when it's a persistent fork, then it would go on right here and it would go on right here. Uh, and of course that's not a good thing. I mean, we will talk about the implications later on, but just as a, a quick teaser, when you think about it, of course there's a lot of uncertainty in there. Uh, you may not know which one of these uh, two versions, which essentially just represent uh, a state of a database, state of the blockchain, uh, to believe, um, or it could it could uh, lead to a, a split of the entire network where you had one asset before and then there are two competing assets created thereafter. But let's go step by step and briefly look into the reasons uh, why these forks may emerge. Because the first thing you have to understand is that uh, fork, the term fork is somewhat convoluted. Uh, you hear it a lot in the blockchain community. You, you read it a lot also in the academic papers that are written about blockchain. Um, but unfortunately, um, people use it in very different ways and uh, most people do a very bad job in explaining what exactly they are talking about. So. What you have to understand first is that there are two reasons, two reasons why a fork may arise. And the first one is when we assume that uh, we have the same rules for both of these miners right here. So let us denote the rule sets as in this case A and B. Uh, we can think of it as a, as a set and whenever uh, a new block is created, uh, it can be either an element of the set, so it falls within the set, or it can be outside of the set, so it can uh, it can be not an element of the set. And what it means is whenever a block is an element of the set, then we assume it would be accepted under the rules of this set, okay? So A, for example, right here is just a set of consensus rules. When we have, let's say, a block uh, B3 right here, um, we say it's an element of A, so it falls within this set, then we would assume that it, this block, this particular block would be accepted and is in fact in accordance with the rule set A. Now, when we're talking about the same rules, then we have a, a rule set A right here and a rule set B right here, but it turns out the two rule set are exactly the same. So in fact, there is only one rule set. And what do I mean by that? Under a same rule fork or a process-based fork, um, all of the involved parties, so in this case the miners, are creating blocks in accordance with the same rules. So there is no disagreement on the rules. Uh, they all know the rule set that they actually uh, uh, are in line with it. They are creating blocks in accordance with it. Um, but there still may be, as you will see later on, some examples of forks, at least for a short uh, amount of time. So again, when we have the same rule set, we call that process-based forks. Um, what's really important is uh, when they have the same rule set, then usually the reason why this fork is created is because they do not have the same information set. Uh, so it could be that one of these miners 
doesn't know about the other block, that both of them don't know about the other block. Or as you will hear later on, as you will see later on, usually they will know about it, but just with a certain delay because of network propagation. Uh, the most common case of these process-based forks is simply because these two blocks are created at approximately the same time and then we end up in a so-called block race. So yeah, that's, that's the uh, uh, same rule example, the process-based example. The second reason why a fork may arise is when there are different rules. I think intuitively that's much clearer, that's pretty easy to understand, even though it is a much more complex case, as you will see later on. But intuitively, when you think about it, when you don't use the same rules, when you have a disagreement on the rule set, so when my block acceptance set A is not equal to your block acceptance set B, then of course at some point you will reach a point uh, where you are accepting a block and I'm not all the other way, I'm not accepting the same block all the other way around. Uh, so I think it's pretty easy to understand when you have different rule sets, when you have different consensus rules, and we talk about a protocol-based fork, um, then uh, it's probably easier to understand why this may lead uh, to a split of the ledger, to a split of the blockchain. Now, let's look into the various types of forks, and this is based on a paper I've published in the uh, Singapore Economic Review. Uh, again, you can see the, um, the two types, the two... Uh, reasons up here. So we have the process-based uh, reason, we have the protocol-based reason. You can see again here we have the same rule set. Here we have a different rule set. So A is not equal B. And then there are basically two other um, things you have to consider. So one more dimension um, can be unintentional. So just happen as a coincidence, happen randomly or it can be deliberate, then somebody chooses actually uh, actively does something to fork the network. And the examples we have right here is for the process-based, for the unintentional process-based fork would be the probabilistic block race. Um, as I've mentioned, that's simply when, when two blocks are created at approximately the same time. This can happen in probabilistic um, process. Uh, but this, of course, will be resolved when one of these two instances, when one of these chains gets an additional block, uh, then, of course, everyone that is independent has an incentive to go back to the longer version, the one with the higher uh, accumulated difficulty. We will talk about that a lot in the next lecture, so don't worry about it too much. Then we have the deliberate case, the deliberate process-based case. Again, we have the same rules, so nobody changes anything about the rules. Uh, in this case, it's either somebody who creates a forced block race or somebody who decides that uh, he or she wants to catch up with a longer version and puts a massive amount of resources in there. This is usually really, really hard to do and it gets, of course, harder and harder uh, once you have to catch up with an increasingly longer chain, with an increasingly longer delta. Uh, so it's, it's an edge case once again, but it's something uh, you could consider. And block withholding, and there is a really uh, nice paper by AL and Sierra, um, I have referenced it. Um, it's it's called Maturity is Not Enough, Bitcoin Mining is Vulnerable, but usually when, when you talk about that, when you wanna look into the uh, literature, then it's uh, simply, simply called selfish mining. And what they're looking at is a so-called block withholding phenomenon. The idea is that mm, under some circumstances, uh, it might be beneficial for a miner to actually withhold the information that they have found a valid block. So under some circumstances, it might be beneficial when they are not disclosing that they have found a solution, that they have added another block with the basic intuition that they have a head start on the, on, on the, on the next round of mining, that they are one block ahead and that some of the other miners, um, quote unquote, waste their resources on a state that is not the current state of the ledger. Okay, um, you don't have to look into that in greater detail for this class, but it's a really interesting topic, especially if you're interested in game theory and in, this, in these consensus protocols. And then on the other side right here, we have the protocol-based forks. And first of all, it's important to understand here, once again, uh, you have two different versions of the rules. Um, so when you're looking at one person, uh, has, that has created one sequence. This person has different rules than the other person who has created the other sequence. So A is not equal B. 
And that's really important. That's the big difference right here. Here it's really a fork because of changes in the protocol. And here it's a fork because of the process. And the two reasons, um, the unintentional and deliberate one for the protocol-based forks, when we go to the unintentional one, then it's a simple client incompatibilities. So nobody actually wanted to have a rule change. It just happens that there are uh, several clients circulating, um, which is a good thing. And as you, as you can recall from one of our earlier lectures, uh, when you have just a standard, when you just have a, a protocol defined, then everyone could um, potentially create their own client, could create their own software and communicate with the network. Well, one thing that should not happen is that uh, you have a mistake when you implement the consensus rules. Mm, because then, of course, when there are some differences, uh, then you might end up creating a fork just because there are some incompatibilities in your client software com compared to the rest of the network. And then we have the deliberate protocol-based forks which are simple rule changes. So when somebody changes something about the protocol, uh, let's say, for example, I would come up with the idea uh, that we, I don't know, uh, don't need proof of work anymore in Bitcoin. And instead it's it's a good idea when I'm just the boss and I'm calling the next state update. And then this would be uh, Bitcoin, I don't know, Bitcoin private, Bitcoin uh, uniboss, you call it whatever what you want. Or I'm not gonna do that, by the way. <laughs> uh, and this, of course, would be completely incompatible with anything you've seen. It would be a, it would be a rule change. It would be a different consensus protocol um, and thereby a deliberate protocol-based fork. Now, we will look into some of the subcategories because these protocol-based forks, they can create soft forks, hard forks, and also forced forks. And this is really important to understand because this has huge implications for the persistency of these forks. When you when you change something about the protocol, that's especially important here in the deliberate case, uh, because obviously in the unintentional case, you're not going to plan what you're going to do. Uh, you didn't plan on doing it anyway, so it just happens, it just occurs. But here in the deliberate case, when you want to change something, it can make a big difference whether um, the change corresponds to soft fork, a hard fork, or a forced fork in terms of the implications on the network. But we will look into that in greater uh, detail. But first, let's take one step back. Again, process-based forks, these are simply your nodes. We already quickly talked about that. The uh, probabilistic block race uh, is uh, when two or more blocks are created at approximately the same time. Uh, I've mentioned that, and that's of course possible in a probabilistic system. Um, we also briefly talked about the forced block race. So when somebody is deliberately working on their own personal uh, version of the chain uh, with the goal to catch up with the the rest of the network that is in the lead. Uh, and we also quickly talked about block withholding and here you have the reference to the paper I've mentioned earlier. Um, all of these process-based forks are temporary and they can be resolved with this accumulated difficulty or longest chain rule. Um, it's pretty obvious when you have the same consensus rules, when you don't change anything about that, then you still have this clear rule in effect that whichever version is the longest or more precisely whichever version has the greatest accumulated difficulty is actually the clear leader. And there might be some uncertainty for a certain amount of time, for a certain time period, but they would always come back to a clear winner in this case. Now, much more complicated are these protocol-based forks, as I've mentioned. Uh, I've talked about the client incompatibilities. I gave you the reasoning that when you have a protocol standard, um, when, when anyone can just create their own clients that are in accordance with the standard, there might be a situation uh, when some of these rules aren't clearly defined, when there is a misunderstanding on how to implement it, or when, when there is a simple bug in one of these client versions. And in this case, um, it could unintentionally um, we could unintentionally end up in a situation where there is a protocol-based fork. In fact, this happened back in 2013 with the upgrade to the Bitcoin client 0.8, which turned out, which turned out to be incompatible with 0.7, which was a, a really bad situation to be in because the network just split in half. And what they did at that point in time is they rolled it back. So they um, talked to various miners and uh, asked them to actually downgrade to 0.7 and move back the, the blockchain to the older version so they could resolve the issue. But that's a really bad situation to be in when you have multiple clients that should be compatible in theory, when it turned, then it turns out for a bug 
or uh, just because this, it wasn't well specified and there was a misunderstanding, uh, these various versions, various client versions are creating uh, two versions of the blockchain that are not compatible with each other. But again, I mean, yes, there is this one example, uh, it got resolved, um, but it's not something that happens every day. Obviously, you can see when you have to go back to 2013 and do find one example of that. Uh, that is something that is rather unusual and it never happened uh, again since. Uh, rule changes is the second one. Rule changes are deliberate rule changes. So again, here it's by accident. Uh, it's unintentional and here we are talking about deliberate changes to the protocol and this is probably the easiest to understand when you change something deliberately when there are two uh, interpretations of the rule set uh, when there are two different rule sets rather uh, then of course you can also have two versions of the blockchain and one example is the entire block size debate we will also talk about that uh, in greater detail later in this class um, with the um, split into with the plan Bitcoin ABC, uh, the entire Bitcoin Cash, uh, Bitcoin SV, and so on story. Um, so really, the idea that some of the people had had um, wanted to have larger blocks and go above this one megabyte block size limit that we see with Bitcoin Core, with the actual original Bitcoin implementation. And the the thing with these forks is with the protocol based forks. Uh, that they are not resolved automatically so it may cause permanent splits it can have it can be persistent and what is important now for analysis that's to come is uh, that we need a new notation so let us assume that s old is the uh, set that stands for the old block acceptance set okay so these are the old consensus rules and s new is the new block acceptance set so the new consensus rules so we assume that at a certain point in time t uh, we have a change, a change in the consensus rules, uh, and you have a certain following that goes along with the with the old consensus rules. So some people, some miners are still uh, on the old version, and then you have some people, some miners that are on the new version. And now let's see what happens, because they're all different situations, as I have uh, told you earlier. Now, let us first look at the various uh, types uh, or forks that can that can happen. Um, here you have again these block acceptance sets. So in blue you have the new block acceptance set. In white you have the old block acceptance set. And of course there are different different variations. When you change the rules, it can be stricter. So in this case here with the soft fork, as you can see, it's a it's a stricter um, block acceptance set, which means which means uh, the rules are stricter, which means uh, there are certain blocks that would fall within the old consensus rules, within, within the old block acceptance set, but don't fall within the new one. And with a hard fork, it's the other way around. With a hard fork, the new block acceptance set would be less strict. So there could be blocks that fall in the new block acceptance set, um, uh, but don't fall within the old one, for example, right here. Uh, and then we have the forced fork, and with forced forks, there may be an overlapping area right here, uh, but what is important is that the new block acceptance set has elements that don't fall within the old block acceptance set, and the old block acceptance set has elements that don't fall within the new block acceptance set. So it may, it's also a false fork, for example, when these two areas, when these two sets don't have any uh, intersection whatsoever, so when there is no uh, overlapping area right here. And when you look at the definition right here, what the uh, false fork actually means is that we have something that is element of S new, but not element of S old. And when you have this, this new set, so S new, but not S old, then there must be some elements in here, it cannot be empty. And what also is important, it, it's the other way around as well. So uh, there must be some elements that are element of S old, but not of S new, okay? So this cannot be empty once again. And you can see that easily here. So this area right here, and this area right here, uh, they cannot be empty. So there must be some elements that are uniquely either part or element of set uh, as new and of set as old. And that's the definition right here. So let's go with some examples. What could be an example for, uh, actually let's do the hard fork first because that's much better, much easier to understand. There's a, an example that, that can be better understood intuitively. Uh, 
with a hard fork, let us assume that uh, with the current consensus rules, so with the old consensus rules, you have a block size limit of one megabyte. Let's go with that, okay? So one megabyte, and then somebody says, yeah, uh, I don't like that. I think it's not enough space. I think we need a higher transaction count. Let's go to four megabytes as an example. Uh, then of course, everything, each and every block that is created in accordance with the rest of the rules and uh, is one megabyte or less falls within this S old block acceptance set right here. And then it's also part of the S new block acceptance set. But from time to time, there will be a block created that is larger than this one megabyte. And then of course it would be part of the S new, but not part of S old anymore. Uh, now the implications when you think about it is that in this case, uh, you have a relatively large number, uh, depending on how many miners are still on S old of clients, of consensus relevant nodes of miners uh, that may not accept the longest version. Why? Because the longest version may contain a block um, that is larger than one megabyte and therefore only falls in this S new block acceptance set. So they don't look at, the, at this block and say, hey, this is a valid block. Um, accordingly, they don't think that the sequence, the block sequence that contains this block is valid. So they may be still on another version. They may still be on an older version uh, because they don't accept this, this one block and the sequence that follows. Now let's go with an example for the soft fork and even though this doesn't make too much sense intuitively, I'm going to go with the easiest example uh, that comes to mind. Uh, there are much better examples. We will actually look into one later on in, in this class, but it's way too complicated for, for now when we just want to understand the forks. So let's go uh, with a block size decrease. So we're saying, okay, we had this one megabyte block size limit. Uh, each block cannot be any greater as one megabyte. And for some reason, people say, yeah, this, this takes too much space. Uh, let's actually uh, downgrade. Let's actually uh, go to half a megabyte, let's say. And then of course, again, as long as you create blocks that are half a megabyte or smaller, you are here in the S new, uh, so in the new block acceptance set. When you are in the new block acceptance set and S new is a subset of S old, you're also automatically in the old block acceptance set. So you know this would be accepted by everyone. This would be accepted by all of the miners, no matter whether they are on the old or the new consensus rules. But once a block is found between 0.5 and 1 megabyte, it would still be part, uh, if it's otherwise valid cryptographically, it would still be part of S old but not of S-new, because with S-new, uh, we had the additional requirement that it cannot be any larger than 0.5 megabytes. And here it's one megabyte, and therefore it may, it may be an element of S-O, but not of S-new. And in this case, again, um, S-new may disregard some of these blocks, may re disregard the uh, longest sequence, the longest blockchain, for the simple reason that one of the blocks that are contained in this longest sequence um, is larger than these 0.5 megabyte and therefore not valid uh, with the consensus, in, not in accordance with the consensus rules of SNU. Okay, so then again, we might have this fork. And with forced forks, it's actually quite easy. With forced forks, it's just completely incompatible. There may be some overlap for whatever reason, but you can think of it of just two separate rule sets. Uh, I've previously made the examples of somebody who is changing the consensus rules, let's say from proof of work to proof of authority, or they were just somebody calls the shots. And this may be an example for forced forks. As you will see, it's quite easy to understand in, in the case of a forced fork, no matter what happens in terms of the allocation of computational resources, this will always end in a split of the network. Now, let's actually look at that. Let's look at how persistent these forks are. And you can see that right here, uh, here we have soft forks, hard forks and forced forks. Um, you have the white uh, blocks right here that are created um, as the old consensus chain or in accordance with the old consensus rules rather. And then you have the blue blocks that are created in accordance with the new uh, consensus rules. So let's go with the forced fork. And I've just briefly mentioned that um, there are two cases up here. so. Um, one case we have S new, so the new consensus rules are dominant, which means the computational resources are uh, 
new or greater than the computational resources are old. So more resources are employed in accordance with the new rule set. Or you have here the other scenario where as old is dominant. In this case, there are more resources employed on the old consensus protocol, okay? These are really the two scenarios we have. And under a for, under a forced fork, it doesn't really matter under a forced fork. Um, you always have the situation where both of these chains will um, persist. So you will always have, no matter how many resources are actually deployed on, or actually used on, on one of these two consensus uh, protocols on, on these rules, as long as at least one miner is working on each uh, of them. So as, as long as you have one, at least one miner, one person working on the old consensus rules and one of the new ones, you will end up with both versions. Of course, here in, in this case, right here, as you can see here is new dominant, uh, the new chain will be longer will actually move away further ahead because you have more computational resource on the longer chain. But since it is incompatible, uh, the old one will still persist. And here it's the other way around. Here the old one has more computational resources, uh, so it will run away. But the new one will still persist because it's completely incompatible. Uh, so it's quite easy to understand when you have these incompatible rules, then you will always end up with a permanent split and the fork will be persistent. With a soft fork, it's a little more complicated. With a soft fork, um, when the new one is dominant, so when there are more computational resources employed in the new consensus version, uh, then you will actually just end up with one, with one version of the chain. Uh, there may be the occasional block that gets mined in accordance with the old rules that isn't compatible with the new one, but you will just end up and always go back to just this one version right here as long as the uh, miners that are mining in accordance with the new rule set are dominant. Now, why is this the case? Let's go back quickly. When you look at the soft fork right here, um, then you can see that everything that is in S new, so everything that is mined in accordance with S new is also part of S old. So all blocks that are mined in accordance with this S new consensus protocol, this S new block acceptance set, will also be accepted by S old. And of course, when we assume that S new is dominant, so that the uh, blocks are created faster, so that this becomes the longest blockchain right here. And we also know that this version of the blockchain, so the S new version, is also accepted by the S old guys. And then we know that they will always accept this version right here. Uh, we know that there will only be this one version, um, which is seen as the longest and the most recent version by both S new and S old. It's a little different when S old is dominant. So when the majority of the computational resources stays on the old consensus rules, then of course the old version will run ahead. This will be the longest one. Uh, but in this case, since S new doesn't automatically accept S old, it may still persist and the S new guys may continue to work on their own version because they don't see the S old version, this version right here, as legit. Why is this the case? When we go back once again, it may contain blocks that are part of S old but not part of S new. Um, so it may be seen as invalid blocks. It may be seen as, as not in accordance with the own consensus rules. And therefore, even though it is the longer version right here, um, when it is not accepted by the S new guys, when it is not accepted by these guys right here, they may still continue to work on their own version. So for soft forks, when the new computational resources, the, with the new consensus rules have, has the majority of the computational resources, the majority of the uh, mining power, then there will only be one version of the blockchain, then there is no persistent fork. But when the old consensus set uh, has the majority of the computational resources, then there will be a permanent split, or at least as long as, as the old, uh, as old guys um, have the majority of these computational resources. Okay, and this is really important implication wise. With the hard fork, it's the other way around. With the hard fork, it's when the new uh, consensus rules are dominant. So when they have the larger computational resources, then there will be two versions of the blockchain. Why? Uh, even if it's longer, uh, there may be blocks in the new blockchain that aren't accepted by the old, as old guys. So then of course, uh, it may not be seen as valid. 
Uh, so it's exactly the same uh, reasoning as before with, with soft forks, but the other way around. Whereas when the uh, old protocol is dominant, so when, when there are more computational resources in accordance with the old consensus rules, then a hard fork will lead to just uh, one blockchain and the fork is not persistent. And when you think about the implications, um, then what's interesting is uh, when you are expecting that your change, whatever it is, but when you're changing something and you're expecting that you get the majority of the computational resources, and uh, usually uh, you do expect that, otherwise you wouldn't um, change the protocol uh, in, in most cases, um, then you can see that it's much better if you can actually integrate the changes as a soft fork because then you have the chance when in fact uh, your protocol becomes dominant, when your rules be, rule set becomes dominant, that you uh, agree on just a single version. Whereas with a hard fork, um, even if the changes are supported with the vast majority of miners and the vast majority of the ecosystem, uh, it doesn't really matter as long as there is at least one miner mining on the old version, there will be competing versions. And that's why uh, hard forks uh, usually are much more dangerous than soft forks. Uh, and in many cases, people try to implement changes as a soft fork whenever possible. Uh, soft forks, uh, forced fork is the other option. I mean, forced fork, it's quite obvious from the beginning. You don't have to look at the computational resource or anything like that. If a forced fork, it's just no, uh, we will have a disagreement, a lasting disagreement, a persistent disagreement, no matter what. So why do we care? I mean, that's nice, you have the theory now, you understand how to look at these forks, that there are different versions of these forks, that there are different reasons, but why should you care? And number one is uncertainty. I mean, economically speaking, it's pretty bad when you don't know about the confirmation status of your transaction, when you cannot be sure when something has been confirmed, uh, let's say on one branch, um, in the case of a fork, if this is actually the, the most recent version, or if the confirmation uh, will be disregarded by other people. They would, this would be a really bad position to be in and saw some uncertainty and of course uncertainty is not good for an economic system. Number two, confu confusion. Uh, there may be situations where there are various competing versions of the same asset and we're talking about persistent forks um, and you have a, you have a fork, uh, let's say a fast fork uh, with Bitcoin. Um, what happens is that when you had one Bitcoin uh, at block T where the fork occurred, then at block T plus one, you would have one Bitcoin and one one copy of that Bitcoin for what, whatever it is called on the fork. Let's go with, with uh, the Bitcoin Cash example, for example. Um, then you would have one Bitcoin on the, on the original chain and one Bitcoin Cash on the other chain. Now, in the case of Bitcoin, there never has been um, any uncertainty which of these chains is actually referred to as Bitcoin. I mean, it's ever, ever been pretty clear, there have been some challenges, but from a community point of view, it's always been pretty clear which of these chains uh, is the original. There never has been any doubt with regards to that, at least not from, a, from the broader sense of the community. But there could hypothetically speaking be situations where something like this happens, when there is a uh, disagreement that really splits the community in the middle, for example, and then you suddenly have these two versions of Bitcoin. Um, or something, I mean, with Ethereum that happened before, I'm not going into any details here, that's something we will talk about in a different class uh, next semester, uh, but with the DAO fork that essentially led to the split into Ethereum and Ethereum Classic, it was far from clear uh, at least for me personally, um, which of these two versions will succeed. I mean, both of these versions had legitimate reasons for their existence and uh, good reasons why um, uh, the action that actually changed everything uh, might have been a good idea, but also why it might have been a bad idea. And in these cases, it's just not that clear. It may add some confusion and even worse so when people um, go and they, they have no idea about this space, let's say they just start off and then they see all of these variants uh, of Bitcoin, they may be really confused, uh, may actually end up buying the wrong thing, which would be really bad. So that that is a big deal. And then of course security tokens, that's not necessarily something of concern in the Bitcoin space anymore because color coins, so um, the addition of additional assets 
onto the Bitcoin blockchain essentially is that. But certainly for Ethereum with the ERC20 tokens, with security tokens, which essentially are a promise for delivery on external assets, this is a huge issue. I mean, when you have a split of a native protocol asset, uh, like Bitcoin or Ether, that's not such a big deal. It's still pretty bad. But at least since you don't do not promise anything or to deliver anything, uh, and a Bitcoin is just a Bitcoin, it's just a Bitcoin, um, you can see how it plays out. You can see uh, which of these two versions will actually uh, perform better on the market. But let us assume there is a token that promises the, the delivery of an ounce of gold. Okay, so I'm saying, okay, whoever can uh, present this fragment of a Bitcoin uh, to me, this color coin, uh, gets an ounce of gold from me. Okay, I promise to deliver that. In case of a fork, this becomes pretty bad because then you don't know which of these two versions, uh, which of these two fragments that exist on both versions uh, actually contains a promise for delivery. Uh, and this is a big issue in, in, in the case of security tokens. And then of course it's a cost driver. I mean, there are so many tax questions, legal questions. Uh, you have to make sure that you uh, remain compatible you have to be really careful when you're spending coins on one chain uh, that you don't get attacked by a so-called replay attack where somebody just uses your transaction and puts it on the other version of the chain, uh, your signed transaction. So there are many things to consider and it's pretty dangerous. And uh, especially for companies, it's a huge cost driver when these uh, forks appear. Um, but there is one positive thing also, and especially for Bitcoin, many people always... Um, say that it is a big weakness of Bitcoin that it that it cannot be changed that that there's um, that it's so hard to change something about Bitcoin and that is exactly because of these forks right because you need the the agreement of, of a broader community because of the risk of these forks but you can also see it as a positive thing I mean when you have something you know exactly what you get you know exactly that you have this base layer that is, is relatively uh, resilient and cannot be changed easily and this might also be a good thing because you can still build on top of it you can have layer two solutions on top of it but having a relatively stable base layer with a consistent set of rules must not necessarily be a bad thing and if there is one good thing about forks then it's really this threat the threat that the network could split in half and the threat that the community could split in half uh, it actually uh, makes people more reluctant um, when they're proposing uh, new ideas. And uh, sometimes that's, of course, bad for innovation and uh, uh, keeps things stuck with the status quo. Uh, but sometimes it also, uh, the status quo and this, this um, consistency may be for the better. So... Here are the two references. Most of this um, session today of this video has been based on this paper right here, which is forthcoming in the Singapore Economic Review. And I also talked about the selfish mining paper uh, by Ale and uh, Sierra. It's called Majority is Not Enough. Bitcoin Mining is Vulnerable. Um, you don't have to look at this paper for the exam for the University of Basel students. But uh, it's, it might be helpful to understand some of these concepts in greater detail. And it is certainly is really interesting. All right. So that's it for today. Stay curious. See you soon.